Hello, and welcome to the Being Human podcast, where we explore what it means to be human, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We upload an episode of this podcast every single week, so whether you're new here, or if you're returning and you have not yet, make sure to hit that subscribe button. That is the best way you can help support the podcast, and it also ensures you do not miss any of these episodes. On this episode of the podcast, I sat down with Brady Holmer. Brady is a student and researcher of human performance and physiology. He is also an endurance athlete specialising in running. I've been following Brady on Twitter and reading his substack, Physiologically Speaking, for 18 months now, and I have picked up so many gems when it comes to physiology, running performance and overall athletic performance from consuming Brady's content. So it was great to sit down with him today and really nerd out on physiology, nutrition, all of the aforementioned areas. We went into it all. We went into VO2 max, your aerobic capacity, your anaerobic capacity. What do all of these terms that we hear so much actually mean on a physiological level? And how can you improve those metrics to ultimately improve your athletic performance, improve your endurance? We then move the conversation into nutrition. I asked Brady questions such as, does the anabolic window exist? Do you need to consume protein as soon as possible post-training? Do you need to consume carbs as soon as possible post-training? Does delaying your carbohydrate intake post-training hinder your recovery for your next training session? We then finished off the conversation with some specifics for runners, running performance, Brady gave us some tips on how you can improve your running economy, how to add volume to your running program. Really good conversation. Brady really knows this stuff. If you enjoy it, please make sure to give this video a thumbs up, drop a comment below, share it around on social media and hit that subscribe button as well. If you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, make sure to hit those five stars and hit that follow button as well. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And thank you for supporting Being Human. The Being Human podcast is brought to you by health.com health is bringing you all of the best supplements such as ancient nutrition's bone broth protein and momentous grass-fed whey protein myself and my whole family use health to shop for our favorite supplements they have all the best supplements as i said from all over the world all of your different protein supplements to your vitamins and minerals they have it all everything you need to improve your athletic performance and your general health and vitality Check out their store by heading to health, that's H-E-A-L-F dot com and use forward slash waglele to get 10% off your order. That's H-E-A-L-F dot com forward slash W-A-G-L-E-L-E to shop health supplements and get 10% off of your order. And now presenting Being Human with Brady Homer. To start off then, Brady, if you could give us, please, your background in terms of your study, occupation, your research, and your background as an athlete as well. Sure thing. So I um, I have my bachelor's degree in exercise science, um, and then I have a graduate degree, a master's degree in human performance. Um, I graduated last December and uh, got my master's degree in that. My my time in graduate school was a little bit interesting. I actually started a PhD program um, at the University of Florida. I was uh, studying exercise physiology and then ended up um, not finishing the program, but still um, obtaining my master's degree from there in, in human performance. And while I was there, so during graduate school, I, I got a lot of experience doing clinical research, which was very, very fun, very interesting. And it allowed me to, to see kind of how the inner workings of, of science are running trials, um, even kind of coming up with the trial, you know, as your PhD, as part of your dissertation, you, you come up with a project, you kind of write a sample, like a grant, basically, essentially you propose that and do all kinds of stuff. So, um, I participated in a lot of clinical trials, um, not as a participant, but, you know, as a, as a research assistant, um, looking at how exercise affects the cardiovascular system, how it affects the heart, endothelial function, blood pressure, things like that, both in the short term and then in the long term. So um, in response to exercise training. So kind of my my focus during graduate school and I would say what my real expertise is in is cardiovascular physiology related to exercise. But of course, um, my graduate degree is in human performance, which means I have a pretty good background in, in all things, you know, strength and conditioning sort of, that wasn't a majority of, of my training in graduate school, but obviously as an exercise science, um, major, you know, you get um, some training in strength and conditioning and things like that. 
biochemistry, medical physiology. And so I think what, what my training and what my education allowed me to do is not only, you know, gain this expertise in exercise physiology, but I became so interested during graduate school in just science in general. So like, I love health, I love nutrition. And so of course I'm interested in endurance sports and exercise, but I began to write about and just read about like longevity and the biology of aging and all these things during graduate school. And then that kind of led to my transition um, after my degree into doing what I do now, which is broadly what I would consider to be science communication. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a researcher and the fact that I, I do like scientific, not research um, involved in clinical trials, but I do, um, you know, reading things all the time, just on the latest science, writing about it on my sub stack, um, in addition to um, kind of like a freelance science writer. So that's, that's currently what I'm involved in now regarding um, my career. Regarding my athletic background, I am an endurance athlete. I always kind of have been, you know, I, I played sports growing up like basketball and, and baseball and stuff. But eventually when I turned, you know, 13 and entered junior high school over here in the States, which would be grade seven and eight, I started running track cross country, ended up being pretty good. And ever since then, I've just been an endurance runner. So um, mainly 5K on in cross country on the track, 5K and 10K once I got into college um, running the 3K. So definitely a distance runner, not uh, a sprinter. And then post collegiately, just continue to continue to run. So marathon, half marathon, kind of what I'm doing now. Um, but I've always just loved running. Um, I did run Division One again over here in the states and university. It's Division One, two, and three in college. Um, so I ran at the Division One level at a smaller school, but um, nonetheless, I competed for four years and, and had a lot of fun doing that. So a little bit about my athletic background. I'm by no means an elite athlete, but, you know, I'm, I consider myself at least above the level of a, of a recreational athlete. So a uh, competitive amateur maybe would be the, uh, the uh, correct classification there. Well, I'm by no means an expert on running, uh, nothing of the sort, but uh, seeing the 5k and 10k times that you've posted on Twitter, it seems to me, yes, you're definitely beyond <laughs> the uh, capacity of obvious. And I'm, want to get into some specific running questions, some protocols for how people can improve their running performance um, in a bit, because we were talking about sports just before we hit record on this thing. And uh, you were saying how we're coming from different sporting sides, you from the endurance running side, me from um, grappling, mixed martial arts. I do actually, or I have done quite a lot of ultramarathon running at this point, but that's why I'm keen to get your nuance and uh, your expertise in on the job, because I've been doing that not as someone that is a, a com an accomplished and efficient runner. I've been doing it purely on uh, mental toughness, if you will, and grit and just kind of putting one foot in front of the other. So, yeah, definitely. We'll get into some running performance protocols. But before we do that, I think it's um, good if we have like a, a really good overview of human performance. I, I really like the name of that degree because I think that encompasses uh, – it's a great label, right? You know, human performance is not just about physiology. It's about nutrition, strength, conditioning, as you said. So to kick things off in that regard, I want to start with VO2 max. VO2 max is a term that's thrown around a lot. And a lot of people listening to this podcast, I'm sure, will know what it is. But uh, I think some people, it's one of those terms that they hear, but they don't really know on a high level basis what that actually means. So to start off, what is VO2 max? Yeah, it's very a very popular term, kind of like a buzzword these days on, on social media. You hear a lot about it. Um, I've even, you know, I talk about it a lot. I've wrote a book about it. So VO2 max is the maximal rate uh, the, at which your body can utilize oxygen during exercise. And what it represents is the integrative ability of your lungs, your heart, your blood vessels, your skeletal muscle, and your mitochondria to take up, distribute uh, oxygen, and then deliver that oxygen um, and use it to the mitochondria and use it to create energy in the form of ATP. So when people hear ATP, it's kind of uh, considered the energy currency of the cell is kind of how it is, is often thought of. But when I say used to create energy, used to create ATP that we use for muscle contraction. And so um, again, the maximal rate of oxygen consumption, I think it's important sometimes to distinguish that because sometimes people will say it's your 
it's how much oxygen you can take up. And while technically that is true, it's it's a rate rather than kind of an absolute amount, I guess. So maybe just a, a, a semantic difference that maybe doesn't matter to some people, but um, it represents a rate. And so the way that it's expressed, at least relative to your body weight, is in milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute. And so if, if any of your listeners have gotten a VO2 max test or ever go to get a VO2 max test, when you get res your result back, you'll get one of your absolute VO2 max and how many liters of oxygen per minute you're consuming. And then another one expressed relative to your body weight, milliliters per kilogram per minute. That latter one, the relative VO2 max, I would say is a little bit more important or at least maybe more relevant to your performance because you need to standardize VO2 based on body weight because obviously uh, a larger person is going to have a greater oxygen consumption. So if you take say a guy who is 250 pounds, or you take someone like myself who is close to 250 pounds, they will probably have a larger absolute VO2 if we were to get on the treadmill and run. But then expressed to our body weight, mine might be almost twice as high. And so if you were looking for in terms of a competition or a performance, relative VO2 max is really what's going to matter. If you can think about it similar to watts per kilogram in cycling. Um, you know, somebody who's 300 pounds, well, they can produce a lot of watts on the bike, much more than somebody like myself maybe could. Um, but when you're moving a bike, it really matters what your relative watts per kilogram is. That's going to determine how fast you're going to be able to go. Um, and so the Tour de France riders, they can obviously, they have a high absolute power output, um, but they're very light. And so their watts per kilogram is extremely high. Hopefully I didn't confuse people by using that analogy, but it's just important uh, to express it relative to body weight. So again, VO2 max, um, I, that was kind of a more technical definition, but really what it represents, again, another way to, to describe it is your aerobic capacity. Um, so your cardiorespiratory fitness, sometimes those are always used, those are used interchangeably, but a good way for people to think about it is your, it's a, it's a measure of your aerobic fitness, one of the best measures of your aerobic fitness. And how important then is this VO2 max metric for athletes? We, like you said, it's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. And uh, you've got people like Peter Atia saying it is the number one metric you want to use to measure your longevity or expecting longevity by. So it seems as though the jury's out on its link to longevity, even if it's not a, a causal link. But for athletes, how important is it to have a high VO2 max and how in, how does that differ between, say, a marathon runner to a sprinter? It's it's definitely important, but it certainly is not the most important factor, in my opinion. So the way that I like to think about it, I'll maybe talk about its importance for kind of endurance sports first, because obviously that's kind of where VO2 max is, is most talked about, where it kind of originated and where the correlation of high VO2 max and endurance performance started. So it's certainly correlated to endurance performance. And I would say it's a prerequisite for elite endurance performance. In other words, there's almost a little a buy-in of VO2 max in order to get to the elite level. So, you know, if you don't have a VO2 max that's 65 or above, there's a very slim chance that you're going to be competing for first place at the, you know, the London marathon or something like that. It's just not going to happen. Um, you kind of have to have a minimum VO2 max to at least enter the club. But then if you look at all of the elite athletes, so if you take everybody on the starting line of the London marathon, all of the elite athletes, all the, all the Kenyans, all the British runners, all the American runners, and you look at all their VO2 maxes, that might range from 65 to 85, maybe even 90 but you're not going to be able to determine the winner of that race just based on VO2 max. In other words, just because one guy has an 85 and another guy has a 75 doesn't mean that guy with the 85 is going to win. Um, and that is because there are other important variables that determine endurance performance. And I won't go too deep into what they are, but your ability to run at a high percentage lactate threshold. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit when we get to anaerobic performance and your running economy. So, how much oxygen are you using per 
kilogram or per kilometer that you cover, or how fast can you run per um, liter of oxygen that you consume, like miles per gallon or miles per kilometer in a car, kind of a similar thing. How efficient are you? Those things seem to be a little bit more important than VO2 max in terms of predicting overall performance. But again, VO2 max is certainly one of the three kind of pillars um, of endurance performance in that you need to have a high VO2 max to be pretty competitive. And all endurance runners are at least to some degree concerned about how high their VO2 max is. They're looking to um, improve it. So it's certainly important, but again, it's not the, it's not the only thing that endurance runners are um, concerned with. And at a certain level, you kind of start to not really care too much about your VO2 max. So I consider myself a competitive endurance runner, but I, on a day-to-day -day basis, don't really think about what kind of training I'm going to do to increase my VO2 max because it's already pretty high and increasing my VO2 max more might not actually lead to a better marathon time. I would probably be better off focusing on my running economy or uh, my lactate threshold or just my overall raw speed. Um, you know, how fast can I run a mile? I would probably benefit a little bit more than that uh, compared to boosting my VO2 max, maybe another two to three points, which might not yield that big of an improvement given kind of the level that I um, am already at. And then uh, when it comes to, I guess, power-based athletes, so people in, you know, grappling, jujitsu, or I don't know, take basketball or soccer, or football, something like that, view to max is still going to be important. You know, it's not going to be maybe one of the main determining factors as to how successful you are in that sport. But if you think about somebody like yourself, Aaron, if you increase your view to max, if you have a higher aerobic capacity, what that's going to allow you to do is just last longer on a mat. You know, if you have double the view to max of the guy that you're rolling against your endurance, you know, during round nine or round 10 is going to be so much better. You're not going to be huffing and puffing and that's going to ultimately allow you to produce more power or get into the position you need to be. Um, my limitations of talking about <laughs> grappling kind of extend there. I don't know if any of the, uh, the actual terms, but you know, you need endurance for all of these sports, even though they're not classically considered to be endurance sports. I mean, anything that's, you know, a, a basketball uh, game lasts, you know, 90 minutes or more, a grappling match might last one to two hours. A football match, you know, is 90 minutes of basically straight running, no timeouts. So your endurance performance, your aerobic capacity plays into all of those as well. Um, so VO2 max can certainly be important for people involved in those sports as well. So with that said, what are the best protocols for somebody looking to improve their VO2 max, presuming that they're an athlete playing some kind of sport, so they already have a decent VO2 max? Uh, and what's kind of, is there like a, kind of like a baseline or um, a certain standard that you would expect somebody that is a competitive or professional athlete to have when it comes to their VO2 max? Yeah, there are, there are kind of tables, you know, if you even just did a quick search online um, or, you know, if people, I have a table like even in my book of, you know, based on your age and based on your sex, you know, where, you know, what's an average VO2 max look like? What does above average look like? What does elite look like? What does superior look like? I would say that if you're an athlete, somebody who is very reasonably fit, um, of looking at a VO2 max between 50 and 60 is kind of something that I would expect. Um, and anytime I refer to like a level, typically for males and females, it's going to be sort of similar. But, you know, if I said like, oh, average for a male is 50, Females can generally just subtract like five from that and kind of get a range of where their VO2 max might fall in. But at least at athletes in any sport, you know, at a pretty high level, uh, I would expect to have a VO2 max between 50 and 60. That's if they're not an endurance athlete. If you're a higher level endurance athlete, you're probably going to have a VO2 max of 60 or above between 60 and 70. And then at the very elite levels, you know, you're looking at like 75, 80. 85, um, even 90, looking at like the cross country skiers, some of these two different cyclists guys uh, have ridiculously high VO2 maxes. But for the general fit person, something between 50 and 60, that would be very good, um, a very good VO2 max. So then you ask about protocols. It's a, a very, it's an area of debate, and I'm not even sure that it should be. I guess what the debate is, is that there's a lot of nuance when it comes to saying, 
these protocols will improve VO2 max. It's, it's pretty well accepted that doing high intensity intervals is the best way to improve it. And then when I get to discussing this, what I kind of then am hesitant to do often is like to recommend a certain length of an interval or a certain actual interval protocol, because a lot of things are going to work. You know, a common protocol that floats around the internet is this four by four protocol where you do four rounds of four minutes at 85 to 95% of your VO2 max. That's incredibly good protocol for improving your VO2 max. Is it the best? I don't know. There might be other protocols that are better, but it's certainly a good one. Um, that one has been mo more heavily studied than some of the other protocols. But I would say if you're an athlete, endurance athlete or not, um, doing some type of high intensity interval that lasts one minute to maybe eight minutes in duration is going to be very effective, maybe even longer than a minute. So maybe two to eight minutes would probably be a bit better. Um, and then you want to perform that at around 85 to 95% of your maximal heart rate. It's hard to do it at a maximal percent of your VO2 max. If you don't know what that is, and you're not measuring oxygen consumption during exercise. You can't really, you know, at, uh, determine whether what percent your VO2 max you're at, but you can exercise at a percentage of your maximal heart rate. 85 to 95% is um, typically going to be what those high intensity intervals are at. Those are typically going to be kind of the best way to improve your VO2 max. There was actually a study that just came out showing that one of the best predictors of, you know, no surprise, but one of the best predictors of the VO2 max improvements in response to training was how much time people spent at 90% or more of their VO2 max. And obviously there are limitations there. People, you can only perform so many high intensity intervals per week. You can't go 90% of your VO2 max every single day, um, but you wanna spend a good time, you know, each week you wanna do some type of intervals that are at the upper end um, of that, of your heart rate and kind of getting your heart rate up there. So again, two to eight minutes, 85 to 95% of your max heart rate, do that once, a week and you should be um, pretty solid. I think that is kind of a, a blanket protocol from there. You know, people can kind of do whatever they like in terms of number of sets, rounds and things like that. Um, but again, the four by four protocol is certainly a good one. You could do one minute intervals. Um, you could do that like 10 times. There's Tabata intervals. Um, so the, the options are endless. And that's kind of one of the fun things about it is depending on what kind of athlete you are, or what types of intervals you like to do, um, a lot of protocols can work for improving your VO2 max. Um, you can also do less intense exercise though. And I think it's, you know, not, I don't want to make it seem like you have to do inter high intensity intervals to improve your VO2 max. You can do something like a tempo run or a steady state run that will also contribute to helping improve your VO2 max. It's going to help, you know, increase your mitochondrial capacity, um, mitochondrial volume, um, also help with like your lactate threshold and things like that. So those uh, types of runs and those types of exercises will also contribute to it as will this zone two training, though not as much. Again, if you want to, if we're just talking about like what improves your view to max the best, it's exercise that is at a higher percentage of your view to max. It's higher intensity exercise, but all exercise intensities contribute in some way, but you're not really going to increase your view to max if you're a trained person much just by doing uh, zone two training or what is considered to be zone two training. You know, it's a very technical term, but you know, low, low intensity training, I guess would be a better way to say that. And just to clarify something, cause I think this can be a point of confusion with people when we're saying, um, you know, four by four, whatever the interval is, and you're doing that at 80 to 90% of your vo2 max or max heart rate that's not the same is it as 80 to 90 percent effort in order to perform at 90 percent of your vo2 max or 90 percent of your max heart rate that's going to feel like 100 percent effort for most people right yeah i would say so um you know especially for people who might be new to interval training um if you're somewhat untrained yes it will it might initially feel like you're going hundred percent even and sometimes it might be a real 10 out of 10 effort i mean even for trained athletes because for someone like myself i you know there are all kinds of different athletes in terms of how your heart rate responds to training i have a very hard time getting my heart rate high so i mean in order to do it in order to get my heart rate to 90 percent 
I, I really have to run all out. So it's not going to be an eight or nine out of 10. It's going to be a 10 out of 10 or a 12 out of 10, you know? So yeah, the, the intensity required to get there might be a harder intensity, um, effort on the, you know, say one to 10 effort scale. Yeah. That's definitely, uh, I think a good point to make. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely an important point to clarify. Cause sometimes when I'm a PT and, and when I, uh, train people, I'll sometimes not go into the real nuance of VO2 max, et cetera, but I'll say something along the lines of, yeah, you, you'll be working at around 80% of your max heart rate. And they think, oh, okay, so I'm not going all out. It's like, no, 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 you, mm -hmm. you, you'll need to work as hard as you possibly can in order to hit that metric. So I think that can be a point of confusion a lot of the time for people. Um, you meant, so, sorry, go on. Yeah. And, and it actually might, you know, that effort might actually change as the interval progresses too. So if I'm exercising at, if I do an interval at 85% of my max heart rate for, for four minutes, that might not be that hard. I can complete that pretty easily. If I do a tempo run, that's 30 minutes long at 85% of my heart rate, I might start at a seven out of 10. I might end at a 10 out of 10. So the, the intensity is going to definitely come into play there as well. And you mentioned zone two training. I wanted to ask about that as well. Uh, zone two training often gets uh, associated with the label aerobic capacity. And you've already touched on the fact that your VO2 max is basically your aerobic capacity. But um, that term has kind of been maybe hijacked or depending on, on, on what you think of it, or, or just used to describe kind of like the quote unquote base of the pyramid that long the ability to perform at a lower intensity over a longer period of time so what we would call that long longer intensity or lower intensity sorry steady state cardio to go into that how important is that for endurance athletes you already mentioned the effects that lower intensity uh, longer form cardio has on vo2 max but how important is that for an endurance athlete versus then the uh, more power-based athletes, like you said, a, a grappler or a soccer player, a football player, for example. F for those guys, is there much benefit in doing that longer form cardio versus the, the higher intensity stuff? Yeah, I would definitely say so. So we'll start with endurance athletes again. So it's important for endurance athletes, as you mentioned, Aaron, to kind of build that aerobic base, um, which will help you kind of perform, you know, everything upstream and, and sharpen kind of the tip of that pyramid, I guess, so to speak. Um, and yeah, zone two training, just to maybe put like a, a definition on it, I guess, is the, I've, I, you'll hear it defined in many ways. And I don't even think I have a perfect clear cut definition of it, but I think the guy who popularized it, uh, Inigo, Inigo San Milan, um, he's kind of a researcher from University of Colorado Boulder. He, he talks a lot a bit about, about it and the way he refers to it as uh, an exercise intensity where you're maximizing your mitochondrial fat oxidation. So it's an intensity where, you know, lactate is going to be at a steady state. So your lactate production is kind of matching your lactate clearance, meaning that your lactate levels in the blood aren't going to rise. And then again, your fat oxidation is maximal because once you pass max fat oxidation, that means you're slightly getting this anaerobic contribution to energy production. You're using carbohydrate to produce energy in addition to, to fat. So that's kind of what an intensity of zone two um, is kind of defined as. Um, so different from your VO2 max, it's it's still an aerobic, a marker of aerobic kind of exercise performance, um, but it's your kind of maximal fat oxidation. And so um, lower levels of lactate, whereas once you kind of reach your VO2 max or go beyond that, you're going to start to accumulate lactate um, at a very high rate. So yeah, the importance for endurance athletes, again, it's going to help you kind of with lactate clearance, mitochondrial biogenesis, help you improve your fat oxidation capacity, which is certainly a, an important thing for, for endurance athletes. For people not focused on endurance, again, helping with your aerobic fitness, which is going to be beneficial no matter what sport you are in. Um, where I think it has some benefit that is not talked about a lot is just for overall cardiovascular health. So a lot of people, a lot of power-based sport athletes, so whether you're a competitive weightlifter or a recreational weightlifter or 
you're doing jujitsu, mixed martial arts, you're doing American football or regular foot, you know, actual football, uh, the soccer, as we call it over here. Um, all of those sports are maybe kind of more, more power based and less endurance based. And so for athletes involved in those sports, the benefits of zone two might actually be, it's going to contribute to your cardiovascular health because otherwise you might not be getting the aerobic enough aerobic exercise to contribute towards your blood vessel health or your heart health, which are definitely important. You know, maybe not right now, if you're 20 or 30, you might not be concerned about that. But as we age, our heart gets stiffer, our blood vessels get stiffer, our blood pressure goes up. Lower intensity aerobic exercise is super beneficial for all of those things. And the guy, his name is escaping me right now, but there's a guy on X who talks about this all the time in that, you know, weightlifting, very kind of sympathetic dominant sport. It increases your blood pressure when you do it. So it's not necessarily great for your cardiovascular health. And for weightlifters, especially something like zone two training is going to help contribute overall to improving your cardiovascular health, keeping your blood pressure in check, improving your blood vessel function. So I think power-based athletes can kind of think about zone two training in that sense, rather than, okay, maybe you're not actually concerned about getting fitter, um, which everybody can benefit just from being fitter and doing zone two training to get fitter. But from that perspective, I think it's, it's also important to think about. And if you're a power-based athlete, who's not doing any sort of quote unquote aerobic training outside of your discipline, then you should really think about doing, you know, probably 150 minutes per week of just that zone two training to benefit your cardiovascular system in that way. I suppose you touched on it there, but to go into it a bit more, if, if uh, needs be, what are the protocols then for improving that aerobic base? It seems like it's just a lot of zone two training, right? And if you're an endurance athlete, that's going to have to be, you know, a, a lot more, more hours per week than someone that is a power-based athlete who's just looking to get their zone two in to be a bit fitter rather than directly improving their athletic performance. Yeah. If you're an endurance athlete concerned with, you know, if you're not training for a marathon or actually directly trying to improve your endurance performance, I would say 150 minutes to 300 minutes per week of that uh, zone two training. So low to moderate intensity training. And to put a heart rate range on that, because heart rate, maybe, you know, everyone's got a heart rate monitor. If you have any type of watch or wearable, you can get your heart rate during exercise. It's pretty ubiquitous these days. Um, 70, uh, 65 to 75% of your maximal heart rate, even as low as 60%, um, even down to 50, I guess, would be really low intensity. So um, we could broaden that range to maybe 50 to 75% of your maximal heart rate. Do that for 150 minutes to 300 minutes per week. So um, you know, that's three days of 30 minutes or three days of 60 minutes or, you know, five days of, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. You can break it up any way you want. I think three days would be optimal if you could do it because frequency is kind of important. So don't just do one day per week where you do 150 minutes. I don't think that's ideal. It can still be beneficial. But um, if you want to do three days per week of 30 minutes, I think that's a great way to structure it. And then if you have more time, kind of build up from there on those days. Um, but yeah, the protocols, again, it's just, it's just pretty simple compared to, to interval training, you know, go out for 30 to 60 minutes to, or more, even 90 minutes to two hours and keep your heart rate between 65 and 75% for that, uh, two hours. That's, that's kind of the protocol. So what the debate over is, um, typically is like the volume per week, you know, how much is necessary. I think 150 is kind of the bare minimum, um, for anyone. I don't, you know, don't really care what sport you're in. I think. You could be doing 150 minutes per week of that 300 if you're, you know, really more concerned with your fitness. And then, like you mentioned for endurance athletes, I think the thing about endurance athletes is funny because there's this whole, and you've probably heard of it, this, this kind of like 80, 20 distribution that everybody talks about, like 80% of endurance athletes, uh, intensity should be zone two, 20% should be high intensity training. I think that that's a good breakdown, but I think what people don't realize and what we should remember is that 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 kind of framework just came from observing patterns of like Norwegian endurance athletes. It wasn't necessarily proscriptive. It was kind of, or it wasn't prescriptive rather. It was, let's look at their training patterns. And when we look at their intensities and break it all down, this is kind of what it ends up being. 80% of their stuff is zone two. 
20% is you know zone four and five. But that's just because they're doing a lot. They're, at, they're working out for 20 to 25 hours per week. And when you're doing that much training, there's only so much high intensity training you can do. So I think as your volume goes up, obviously the amount of zone two you're doing is up. So if I take my training from 15 hours to 20 hours per week, probably four and a half or four of the hours of those are going to be zone two training. Maybe 30 minutes is going to be high intensity training because you're just going to increase the stress on your body if you do more, more, more high intensity training. Um, so I don't think that people who are exercising for two to three hours a week should necessarily follow that. Um, they certainly can, and it could still be beneficial, but I don't think they should be afraid to maybe do a little bit more high intensity training. That's typically kind of how I, how I talk about it. You know, it's, if you're doing 10 hours or more, maybe you should be closer to that, you know, 80, 20. Um, but for other people, you know, you maybe not want to be that concerned about that specific number, I guess. How much truth is there to the zone two training slash your aerobic base helps improve your recovery or capacity to recover? And I suppose that's an important distinction, right? I, I assume, it, you know, doing zone two training doesn't actually promote recovery rather than the greater your aerobic base by virtue of you doing zone two training helps your capacity to recover. Uh, am I right in saying that? I think that's a good distinction because, yeah, it's it's funny when we always talk about you know, in endurance sports, and I'm sure in other sports as well, you have this concept of a recovery day or a recovery run. And I'm like, well, if I truly wanted to recover, I probably just wouldn't run, right? I would just sit on my couch and maybe go for a walk. Like running is inherently stressful. So if I go on a run, even if I'm in zone two, I'm doing, I'm putting a physiological stress on my body. So it's recovery compared to a higher intensity, but is it actually promoting recovery? So I think that is a good distinction. It's certainly improving your capacity to recover. And in a way it's promoting recovery in that recovery is an active process. I sometimes, you know, think we think of it as just don't do anything. And we just are very stagnant. Of course, that plays a part of it. You need to let your sympathetic system, uh, you know, your nervous system kind of recover as well as your, your body, you know, and refueling it and rehydrate and things like that. But Blood flow is also important. Um, just going out, that's why going for a walk or swimming or doing some low intensity, low impact activity often promotes recovery more so than does just laying on the couch where you might otherwise feel stiff. But yes, I think I'd, I couldn't give you a good definition of uh, your, your recovery capacity, but I certainly think that it helps promote processes that then do contribute to recovery. Granted, you actually give yourself the, the real uh, recovery time. Yeah. Moving over to the complete other side of the spectrum then, anaerobic capacity. Um, I suppose it could be helpful as well to give like a, a high level definition of the difference between anaerobic and aerobic, what exactly we mean by those terms. And then, um, yeah, what, what is an athlete or a person's anaerobic capacity? Is that the same as lactate threshold, uh, lactate threshold, sorry, and then again, the pros calls for improving those or that if they are in fact the same thing. Yeah, sure. So um, aerobic energy production, the word aerobic means with oxygen. So that means the energy that we're producing is coming uh, from, we're using oxygen to produce energy. So that's typically, you know, fatty acid oxidation or fat burning uses oxygen. We also can, you know, utilize, or I guess we can break down carbohydrates with oxygen as well, aerobic glycolysis. And then anaerobic energy production is production of energy in the absence of oxygen. And obviously, you know, if we're doing something like a VO2 max test, I think we often think of these things as happening very distinctly. But if I go out and start exercising, if I go out my door right now and just start running down the road, I'm going to be producing some energy aerobically. I'm also going to be producing some anaerobically um, via the, you know, phosphocreatine system, just using ATP and anaerobic glycolysis. But typically when we refer to anaerobic energy production, we're talking about power or speed. So a hundred meter sprint, a 200 meter sprint, weightlifting, you know, if you do a, a deadlift, you're producing energy anaerobically because it's not long enough and it's of a very high intensity. So we need quick energy. We need quick muscle contraction. We're using anaerobic energy production um, 
pathways to do that. So again, breaking down phosphocreatine or PCR to produce energy, um, glycolysis, anaerobic glycolysis, so burning glucose or uh, for energy. So that's kind of the main distinction between aerobic and anaerobic. And yeah, your, your anaerobic capacity, again, just refers to your capacity to produce power or like you said, um, kind of clear out lactate. Lactate threshold, again, lactate threshold is kind of like a somewhat debated topic in terms of like what does, what's the definition of lactate threshold? What does it mean? How important is it? But yes, certainly your lactate clearance capacity plays a role in how much lactate you produce and your ability to clear it uh, is part of your anaerobic capacity. Um, so for people involved in middle distance kind of endurance running, even endurance running, I guess, um, you know, you want to have a high lactate clearance capacity because you are producing a lot of lactate during during those sports. If you're an ultra marathon runner, you know, less concerned about lactate and less concerned about your anaerobic performance in that context. You know, maybe you need to like out sprint somebody at the end, but you're not that concerned with your anaerobic capacity there. But anything kind of lasting zero seconds to 30 seconds and maybe even up to a minute um, is going to be considered kind of an anaerobic energy production. Granted, that's if you're going, going very, very hard. It's like a 400 meter sprint in the Olympics, you know, is kind of going to be the limit of that anaerobic energy production. Even the 800 meter now, which is kind of a sprint <laughs> might be considered uh, kind of anaerobic, but even the 800 meter mile, those have aerobic kind of components as well. So like I said, we, there, all of these things are kind of integrated. If we actually talk about sports, we're producing aerobic and anaerobic energy kind of at different times during the race or during the competition. You know, if you're on the football football field, um, you're running around, so you're aerobic, and you got to sprint towards the ball to kick it in the goal, then you might be producing it anaerobically. Um, so we sh everybody should be concerned about both of them, but they're just, you know, two different pathways by which we produce energy. Um, for improving it, improving your anaerobic capacity, that's just going to be doing activities that put a stress on your lactate clearance capacity. So threshold running for an endurance runner or high intensity intervals um, for a power-based athlete, you know, just doing jumps or repeated sprints, something like that. So if you want to improve your anaerobic capacity, you do quote unquote anaerobic activities. That's kind of going to be the best way to do that. Moving on then into the nutritional aspects of all of this this was actually uh, a question um that uh, you answered on uh, your substack a couple of weeks ago and uh, i i think it will be of great interest to a lot of people because again it's a hotly debated topic uh, you've got lots of people going keto carnivore vegan diet is something that people are incredibly passionate about a lot more so than training um, and, and the question I wanted to kick off in this area is, or kick off with, is does delaying carbohydrate intake post-training hinder recovery? Based on this one study, the study that you just mentioned, um, it, it would appear to delay recovery um, and impair your performance the next day. So you mentioned like people get so very, very tribal about nutrition, more so than training and I don't know why that is, but it's interesting. Perhaps it's because it's so, so individual. It's almost like a religion, but yeah, you know, it's, I think it's controversial because as you mentioned that low carbohydrate keto kind of became popular a little bit. And like people began to talk about it within the context of athletic performance. And then there was, you know, intermittent fasting then kind of gets drawn in there as well. Should athletes exercise fasted? Should they perform intermittent fasting or time restricted eating occasionally? Does that help with fat burning or if they're trying to improve their body composition? All of those are relevant. And I think, you know, I, I wouldn't recommend, you know, fasting for athletes is, you know, athletes, their main concern is making sure they're, you know, in a caloric maintenance at least um, to support their athletic event. That's kind of their primary concern. Although some athletes are interested in improving their body composition. So for that, you might want to be in a caloric deficit, but you know, there's this whole idea, I think, popularized maybe in endurance sports, but I'm sure it's in other sports as well, where maybe we want to exercise faster or maybe after we work out, we want to not eat for a couple of hours to kind of extend our fast, extend that fat burning process, keep the body in a catabolic state 
uh, you know, to enhance some of the metabolic adaptations. Um, and I think to some extent that's actually true. I mean, if you exercise fasted, you're going to burn fat during exercise. If you don't eat directly after exercise, you may um, upregulate some of these signals that will improve your mitochondrial biogenesis or improve your glycogen storage capacity. But that might all come at the expense now of how you perform the next day and your ability to recover. So this study that I covered, um, it was a very simple one and you know it was in a smaller number of participants, but essentially what they showed was if you perform high intensity interval training, and then they had a group who consumed carbohydrate immediately after, and a group who then consumed carbohydrate three hours after exercise. But overall, the day after exercise, their total carbohydrate intake was the same. And then they had them do basically a performance test the next day. The people who delayed their carbohydrate intake, they performed worse, um, significantly worse, both statistically and kind of if you just from a practical perspective, it, they did like 10 less intervals or something during the test, which is a lot. Um, they had a lower exercise capacity the next day. But the hypothesis, though, of why that happened was kind of interesting. So most of the t the kind of traditional thinking is that, oh, if you basically, why do you want to eat carbohydrates right after exercise, um, both for endurance and non-endurance sports? Well, you want to replenish muscle glycogen. If you exercise for 60 minutes, 90 minutes, or do high-intensity training, you deplete your muscle glycogen levels a lot. Um, and so you want to eat immediately after that to start the glycogen replenishment process so that either if you're training the same day or the next day, your glycogen levels are increased and they're at the same level. Um, and then you perform better the next day. Whereas if you delay that, it might not happen. And that's because the muscles are more sensitive to glucose uptake after exercise protein as well. They're a bit more sensitive to protein intake, hence the recommendation to like eat right after you work out. Your muscles are a bit more primed to absorb nutrients after you exercise. And so, but when they measured glycogen in this particular study that I'm discussing, they measured glycogen the next day and the glycogen levels weren't different at all. So their performance was lower, but their glycogen levels were the same. So it wasn't because of their muscle glycogen. They had plenty of muscle glycogen, even the people who delayed their carbohydrates, they had replenished their muscle glycogen stores before the workout the next day. But for some reason, their recovery and their performance was diminished. And I don't think we really know why that happens. I have a couple hypotheses as to why that is. I think, I think when we, when it comes to carbohydrate intake for sports, there is a central nervous system component that we often don't think about where the body just has this mechanism where it can tell if we are in a nutrient deprived state. And if you kind of delay your nutrition after a workout, you're kind of not helping your autonomic nervous system recover. And that's going to manifest in lower performance the next day. That's kind of one of my hypotheses. I'm sure there are other mechanisms involved, but maybe, you know, people who are listening to this, maybe you don't like care about the mechanism. You're just like, Oh, if my performance is going to be worse, if I delay my carbohydrates, then I'm going to eat within 60, 30 to 60 minutes after finishing my workout. I think based on that kind of study, that's would be my recommendation. I'm curious to kind of see if, more similar studies come out um, and observe the same thing. And that was just after a day. So I think that if we extrapolate that to just say like, okay, what if you do this during training all the time? And my, this is something that I've changed myself in, I would say the past year with my training. I used to, I like time restricted eating. I like to, you know, stop eating at night and then like don't eat until 10 or 11, like the next day, even in the context of training, I, I still felt like it was pretty compatible. But I would, you know, do my workout in the morning and then have a coffee and wait a couple hours then before eating my meal. I wouldn't be dying of hunger or feeling necessarily very bad. Um, but I don't think it certainly wasn't helping. So now I'm like making sure right after my workout to get in some sort of nutrition right after that workout, even if it's just like a fruit smoothie with some protein powder in there to kind of kickstart that recovery process. I think all athletes would benefit if they did that. So I've kind of I've ended the uh, delaying nutrition after my workout kind of for this reason, not just because of that study. I, I started doing this well before that, but um, there's just some evidence to indicate that it is harmful if, if performance is kind of your main goal. Yeah, that makes two of us because after I read that post, I it, it got me thinking and um, I, I've started 
I, I'm not. I'm not even going to say experimenting. I just took heed of um, what you'd outlined there, what the study outlined, and, and thought, well, I, I better start eating a bit more before or, or after. Sorry, I've trained because a lot of my training, particularly hard training sessions, occur in the evening and pretty late into the evening. So I uh, finish training, I get in the car, drive home, uh, have a shower, go to bed. And the reason why I, when I originally started training um, in grappling about five years ago, I would have a late dinner. And then I read lots of studies and also kind of found intuitively from my body that when I was eating a lot of food late at night, it was disrupting my sleep, which obviously then has an impact on many things, including recovery. So that's why I'd gone down the route of uh, making sure, go, going into that time-restricted feeling that you spoke about, which of course has lots of benefits. Well, I suppose actually you can give your opinions on that because that is, again, somewhat debated. Um, but, but I think it, there's a lot of benefits to time-restricted feeding on the whole uh, for general health, if not for athletic performance. So that's why I'd gone down that route. And I thought if I have all of my meals before my evening training session, I'll be fueled for my evening training session. I'll be able to go home, not eat, fall to sleep and have a good night's sleep uh, that's not disrupted by late night eating. And then when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to eat my breakfast before my next training session. So I'll replenish the glycogen and be fueled for that next training session. It won't impact my recovery. But as you said, and as you went into there, it has got me thinking now, OK, maybe I should be eating something, even if it's like, even even maybe if it's just what like 20 grams of protein 20 to 40 grams of carbs could could that potentially offset um the uh the diminishment in recovery and and as well just g- give me your thoughts on time restricted fe- time restricted feeding sorry as a whole both as it pertains to athletic performance and general health yeah it's interesting to hear that you were you were training and then going to bed because i well i guess i have a comment on that after this but Cause that seems like it would be almost like the worst case scenario where you're like, just eat your training basically. And then you're going to bed and so you're going, you know, 10, eight to 10 hours then without eating again, I guess. Um, again, if you found that that works for you, a lot of different things can work for people. So I'm sure it wasn't that harmful. You have to like, for you weigh the benefits of, is this going to impact my sleep? What's the, ben- what's the cost of, you know, worse sleep versus like nutrition. So I think in your case, yeah doing a protein smoothie, do a protein bar and, you know, 50 ish grams of carbohydrate, something small, that's not going to disrupt your sleep, but that's going to kind of refuel you from the training session, I think would be beneficial, but the context also matters. And I'm glad you brought this up. I think that you should consume carbohydrates immediately after your workout, especially if you're working out fasted, if you're not working out fasted, I don't know if it's as important. So if you have had three meals that day before your training session, or say even someone's training in the morning, maybe at 10 a.m., but they have a pretty large breakfast uh, two hours before that training session, I don't think you need to be as concerned about immediately replenishing uh, protein and carbohydrates after that workout. It's similar to the anabolic window when it comes to protein. You know, there's this idea that you need to eat protein within 30 minutes after your workout so that you maximize your muscle gains. And if you miss that window, then it, you know, you've kind of like lost all the benefits of the workout. That's certainly not true. And it actually doesn't matter if you have 30 grams of protein before your workout or 30 grams of protein after, as long as that protein is occurring kind of with around your workout. So you can eat before or you can eat after. So if you're exercising fasted, which I do, and which is why I changed my practice around this, I wake up after I haven't eaten for 10 hours. So, you know, I stop eating at seven or eight the next night. I wake up in the morning, work out. You're done at, you know, eight to nine. You haven't eaten for 12 hours. So yeah, you need to, you need to replenish. You have, you've gone all night and you've just worked out for two hours. You need to eat something. But in your case, you've had three meals that day and you haven't trained and then you're training. So you're in a caloric probably surplus going into that training session. Less important, I think, to to eat, but Again, I think you would benefit from having something small on your car ride home before you get a shower and uh, and go to bed. So that's just my my two cents there. Um, time restricted eating. So yeah, I certainly think that there are health benefits. I just from an athletic standpoint perspective, I think that there are benefits, but they are indirect. And what I mean by that is kind of like what I just mentioned. I love I love going for a run on an empty stomach. When I wake up in the morning, I like to have some coffee. 
maybe have like an electrolyte drink that has some glucose in it or some carbohydrate, but I'm going out the door, you know, maybe have some honey. I just, you feel lighter. You don't have to worry about anything like messing with your stomach. I just like the feeling of exercising fasted. So for me, that time restricted eating kind of works. I eat dinner at night, I go to sleep and I wake up and I train. Of course, sometimes I train twice a day. If I run in the afternoon, I'm going to have had breakfast and probably lunch before then. Um, you know, I try to do like three hours between my meal and a run, but, um, regarding like those benefits. So I think the benefits can sometimes be just indirect. Like it allows you to just time your meals with your training session and then kind of still get this longer fasting period overnight, which I think there are health benefits to that, even for athletes, you know, the whole idea of a gut reset, I'm not really sure how much weight that holds, but you do want to give your body a little bit of rest from digesting food all the time. So 12 hours a day minimum probably without eating is probably good for most people. Um, uh, I do think it can help with kind of glucose regulation, but I think the biggest benefit is just going to be this time restriction kind of allows you to, um, kind of align your body's circadian rhythms and kind of eat within, you know, how we're kind of supposed to, you know, when the sun sets, like stop eating when you wake up, you know, start eating. So like eat when it's light out, don't eat when it's dark out, things like that. Um, obviously it's not super practical for everybody, but the beauty of it is that you can kind of time your time restricted feeding to what works. Some people like to do early. So they'll eat from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. and then stop. Some people like to eat from like noon to 8 p.m. and then stop. So um, yeah, the benefits, the benefits are somewhat debated. People are like, oh, is it just because you're restricting calories? I think that there are unique benefits to it. Um, overall, I just think that it can be a good pattern of eating that um, is very customizable. And so I don't recommend against athletes doing it. Again, I do it myself. I've lengthened my eating window and shorten my fasting window kind of recently. What I typically do is like a, oh, I don't know, it's like a 13 to 14 hour, you know, I, I can stop eating at eight at night. I work out in the morning and then eat something around nine 30 or 10 when I'm done training. Um, so that ends up being something like 13, 14 hours, um, which I think is good. So. That's a interesting perspective to hear. And I think that's what most people need to hear because again, people get so tribal when it comes to uh, everything involving nutrition, including the timing of your nutrition, the <laughs> feeding window. You've got some people that are on, you know, the metabolic uh, eating thermogenic perspective kind of things where they're saying you need to be eating eight times a day and you should eat before you go to bed you should eat as soon as you wake up because this is going to maximize testosterone and uh, maximize anabolism essentially and then you've got people on the other side of the fence saying oh fasting is a major key to longevity and you know you should shorten your eating window as much as possible and you should do lots of three-day fasts and for most people on par for them to perform they want to the way they want to perform in their workouts and for them to have a long and healthy life it's going to be a balance it's going to they're going to fall somewhere in the middle right and it's going to differ depending on the individual um just round off the point about the anabolic window for me please brady because uh, again this is something that's gone through the ringer over and over over the years i've heard you know, nutritional experts say things such as the anabolic window doesn't exist. Uh, it was originally a study conducted on dogs um, and there was no human backing. Um, and then recently I've heard lots more people come back around and say, actually, the anabolic window is really important. You need to be eating after your meal. So, yeah, just kind of give us your conclusions on that. Does the anabolic window exist? If so, what is the optimal timing for your protein intake? Yeah, I think... I don't know what the origins of, of the anabolic window are. I think regardless of, you know, where it originated and what the study showed, I think intuitively it makes sense, right? It's like, okay, well, eating right after a workout, you know, it's going to direct that protein towards the muscles that you have just stressed. And so it like, it makes sense. And there is, there is support to the idea that after exercise, muscle protein synthesis is increased um, more so immediately after exercise. And then it kind of, decreases the further you get from exercise. So it would make sense to consume protein in that window where muscle protein synthesis is elevated to kind of enhance that, what is called the anabolic response to protein ingestion. And I'm sure that if you go out there, you could, you could find studies that 
um, or maybe you couldn't, but you know, find studies that show if you eat immediately after, you know, it tends to be good and better for muscle growth. But what most of the latest studies show that are a little more rigorous and kind of comparing like the carbohydrate study I just mentioned, delayed versus immediate protein intake, they show, and here's the key here, there might be a greater anabolic response after your workout if you eat protein. But does that translate into more gains in strength and muscle mass over the long term? That does not appear to be the case. So if you compare it to laying protein intake versus eating protein immediately after, muscle gains are the same, muscle strength gains are the same, as long as your total daily protein intake is the same. So that seems to be the main factor there is your total daily protein intake. Um, if you eat 120 grams of protein a day, um, it doesn't necessarily matter what that distribution is as long as you know, you're know you just getting it all in. Now, of course, there I think that there are some caveats to that. And if you ask kind of some of these protein experts and the protein you know experts who I've listened to and, and bred, they're going to tell you that an even distribution throughout the day is probably optimal. And it obviously makes sense. That's kind of like what most people like to do. I don't think eating 100 grams of protein at dinner for your OMAD, your one meal a day, is going to be ideal. Can you gain muscle and build strength doing that? Sure, of course you can, but it's not going to be optimal. I think, say, let's just use the 120 grams again. Maybe uh, most people listening are probably eating more than that. I typically eat more than probably 120 a day, either two, but um, I'll just use that as the reference. But, you know, eat 30, 30, 30, 30. Four meals a day, 30 grams of protein each, or three, three meals a day, 40 grams of protein, three meals a day, 50 grams of protein, whatever. Just evenly distribute it in three to five meals per day. That seems to be optimal. I actually am kind of like a two meals a day and like a snack. That's just kind of how I like prefer to eat. So I eat like a big breakfast slash lunch. I'll eat something in the afternoon and I'll eat something at dinner. So both of my meals probably have like 50 to 60 grams of protein and then a snack with like 20 or, or something like that. So um, again, the distribution, I would say timing is the least important in terms of are you going to eat it immediately after or wait a few hours? That kind of maybe the least important. Then we have like distribution and then you have total daily protein intake, which is the most important factor definitely um, of them all. At least again, when it comes to chronically, just looking at what matters, it tends to be total protein and then making sure you're, you're training enough. That kind of seems to be the most important thing. But one final point I think to make on that is that doesn't mean you shouldn't eat immediately after your workout. It just means that you shouldn't worry about it if you're not able to. So yeah, if you get home from the gym and it's been 30 minutes, eat if you can. That's going to be the best. You want to eat as close to your workout as possible just because that's another time to like eat. And it's just, you know, it makes sense to just eat closer to your workout. There's no benefit in delaying, even though there might not be a detriment. So it just makes sense to like the first opportunity you get to have some protein after your weightlifting session or after your workout, doesn't even matter if it's weightlifting or, you know, an endurance run, get some protein in. I think that's kind of the best, um, the best practice. Yeah. At the end of, at the end of the day, any marginal benefits or detriments you're going to experience um, in terms of the timing of your protein and even maybe your carb intake are going to be minuscule or, kind of insignificant compared to the overall quantity of protein or carb consumption over the course of a day a week i think that's an important point to note on the going into carbs a bit more then um i mentioned this before this uh it's, it's kind of died down a bit now i think or, or maybe i'm just not seeing it as much but there was a period um a few years ago where people were really touting especially endurance and ultra endurance athletes were really touting this low carb or no carb the keto approach saying um you know it, when you go keto you're really optimizing for fat oxidization it's hard to just get enough carbs in you when you're running a marathon or an ultra marathon so if you train your body to be able to perform not relying on glucose on carbohydrate intake then you're actually going to optimize your performance that way is there truth to this what what's your opinion when it comes to endurance athletes ultra endurance athletes on what is optimal should they be optimizing for carb intake as much as uh, a power-based athlete someone that's focused more on their anaerobic performance 
or is keto a great way to go for them? It can be a good way to go, but I think I'm, I agree with you, Aaron, in that I wouldn't say it's like died down, but there was kind of a period of this lo- low carb keto centric and talking about that in the endurance sport field. It honestly has it, in the last year or so almost like flipped completely on its head. Everything is kind of carbs, carbs, carbs right now. I feel like even among some of the endurance ultra endurance athletes, certainly among like two de front cyclists. I mean, it's almost a competition now almost to see who can cram the most carbohydrates in their mouth during like a race. And, you know, some of these cyclists are trying to push a hundred, 120 grams of carbohydrates per hour or more. The, the guy who recently won the Western States endurance run over here in the United States um, was, you know, consuming 120 to 150 grams of carbohydrates per hour during that. And that's a hundred, you know, that's a hundred mile race. Of course, there are still athletes, endurance athletes who practice kind of the low carbon keto approach and it can work. But I think that, again, there was, I think that there was this theory about why low carb or keto might improve endurance that just didn't necessarily hold up in practice. And I think you illustrated or, or described kind of what that theory was perfectly. Make yourself become a better fat burner. You don't need to carry all these gels with you then during the race because you're fueling your body on fat. Um, you know, you'll kind of spare your muscle glycogen and whatnot. All of that, it kind of, it sounds good. And I think that it does happen. You know, if you're a low carb athlete, you're, you're going to oxidize fat at a higher rate. But when we think about performance and what it means to be a high performing athlete, it really comes down to not your fat burning capacity. Most of the time, it comes down to your glycolytic capacity. How, 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 you know, many carbohydrates can you burn? How many carbohydrates can you take in? That's really what's going to allow you to push the limit, even if it's in an ultra endurance run like we're seeing these days. I mean, it's it's very competitive and it's not just about this low and slow the entire time. I mean, sure, certainly it is. And, you know, if you're going up to 100 plus miles, but even these guys running 100 mile races, you know, they're running seven minutes per mile and your ability to oxidize carbohydrate or your ability to burn carbohydrate and, you know, glycolytic energy production capacity matters a lot. And so I don't think that there's no benefit to doing low carb or keto for endurance. And a lot of athletes find that that works for them. But um, I think what, you know, the tables have almost kind of turned a little bit and we're now like back to carbs, back to realizing their importance, whatever their importance may be. And, you know, for whatever reason um, and why they contribute to helping us perform better during exercise, there's kind of a lot of not debate, but some interesting like studies coming out on that now. But um, yeah, I think, for endurance athletes, it's still, it's still carbs. It kind of always was carbs, even though we went through this little period, like you mentioned. But um, yeah, I think if anything, none of the studies on keto and fat adaptation, keto adaptation have shown if you do this, you'll perform better. It doesn't necessarily enhance your endurance performance. It might help improve your metabolic health if you are like pre-diabetic or something like that, if your diet is terrible. But for someone who let's be honest, most athletes are already good fat burners. Most endurance athletes, even if they're on a higher carbohydrate diet, they're burning through their uh, glycogen stores a lot. If you're exercising fasted, like even myself, I mean, I have a higher carbohydrate diet, but I exercise fasted most days of the week. My body's great at burning fat, even though I'm not on a keto diet and going keto isn't necessarily going to improve my endurance performance. I think a lot of athletes have found similar. And again, the studies just show that might be equal. If you're a very keto adapted athlete, you might perform as well as a carb adapted athlete, or you might perform just as well on keto as you do on a high carb diet, but you're not going to perform better. Um, there's no evidence to, to suggest that if anything, you'll perform worse. So there are studies showing you'll perform worse. There are no studies showing that you'll perform better if you're keto or low carb. And again, that's for endurance sports, but I think the same would apply to power based sports or team sports and perhaps even more. Um, more severely. So if you just think about the energy contribution from those sports, it's certainly more of a glucose carbohydrate contribution compared to, to fat. So I think team sport athletes and people like that would even kind of hit, get more of a performance detriment if they, if they went keto or something that is going to impair their ability to, to utilize carbohydrates, which are going to be their main source of, of energy during activity. Carbs versus sugar. What is the 
actual distinction between carbs and sugar? Because I, I think there's a lot of confusion about this. When you look at a packet of food, it will say carbohydrates, 50 grams, of which are sugars, two grams. And this can be used as a marketing ploy. You know, protein companies can put on their protein bars less than two grams of sugar, which could then be um, confusing for somebody to then look at the back of the pack and go, oh, hang on, but there's, there's 50 grams of carbs. Is there a difference between carbohydrates and sugar? Are carbohydrates sugars still in a, in one definition or another? And what is the practical difference between ingesting carbohydrates in any form and ingest, ingesting uh, sugars, which are carbohydrates? Yeah, so all, carbohy all carbohy carbohydrates are composed of different types of sugars. And when, when your body breaks them down, so even if you eat a sweet potato or a what is you know a complex carbohydrate whole grain bread or a sweet uh, potato a sweet potato eventually your body is going to break that down into simpler sugars so a sugar would be something like glucose or fructose um, a carbohydrate could be um, something like fiber or you know again complex carbohydrates which are many simple sugars put together so typically on a package, if you're reading a package of food, if it says sugar, that typically refers to added sugar. So you'll see uh, maybe cane sugar is added, or I don't know, sometimes even if they add honey to these things, though, I think they probably have to label that as sugar. So it's something like honey, which is a simple sugar. So, you know, a, a carbohydrate is many sugar molecules put together. Um, when we typically refer to sugars, it's referring to simple sugars. So a less complex carbohydrate, a simple carbohydrate. Again, your glucose is your fructose, your honey, your sweeteners, things like that. So if you're reading a packaged product and it says sugar, it's going to be one of those ingredients. They've just directly added sugar to it. Carbohydrate typically refers to the sugars will contribute to that, obviously, but it also means, oh, there's fiber. Fibers are a type of carbohydrate as well. Um, and so it typically includes that, which is why um, if you have a product that has 20 grams of carbohydrates, but it has 15 grams of fiber. It likes to claim that it's keto friendly because you can subtract that fiber from the, it's the net. How, what's the net carbohydrate? You can subtract the fiber from the carbohydrate because the fiber doesn't contribute to your blood glucose. I'm not a kind of expert in that area. I think it's kind of all fancy marketing language, just like you said, um, in terms of like what the glycemic index and, and things like that are. But um, yeah, I mean, carbohydrates are eventually sugars. Sugars are carbohydrates. They're kind of used interchangeably. If we talk about what our body then is using though for energy, it's using sugars, not carbohydrates. So we often like to say carbohydrate burning, even, you know, I'm sure I said it a few times in this conversation, that's technically not accurate. We're not burning carbs for energy. We're burning glucose for energy, which glucose is just, you know, many, many, many steps removed from the carbohydrate that we put in our mouth gets broken down, eventually ends up as glucose or glycogen. And then we use that for energy. So minor distinctions, but again, like carbohydrates and sugars, they're, they're not exactly the same thing, but they're, they're eventually like the same molecules, I guess, is a way of putting that. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> that was very helpful. Yeah. Um, is there a practical difference then for the endurance athlete between ingesting complex carbs and simple carbs? Do, does an endurance athlete um, prefer to ingest simple carbs because then the body doesn't have to break the complex carbs down into simple, uh, sat, there you go, I'm saying it, simple carbs, simple sugars. <laughs> um, uh, or do you want like a, a mix? Because I've heard before complex carbs because they take longer to break down uh, into glucose that's your kind of slow burning carbs, your, your, your longer burning carbs. And it goes back to the, the old kind of wives tale that people used to eat pasta the night before a marathon, because the pasta would be broken down uh, <laughs> into energy over a longer period of time. So you're, you know, your, your pre marathon pasta the night before would kick in like around mile 20 and carry you through. <laughs> that's funny. I haven't, I haven't heard that. That doesn't, yeah, I think that's a little, Seem to be a few errors uh, it, it might be a in how that would work. That, 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 might, that might be an old British wives tale. Yeah, I wish it worked like that. If you could time it perfectly, like my, if I eat my carbs 12 hours beforehand, it like kicks in right at the start of the marathon. Um, I'll have to look into that. That'd be kind of funny to see what the origin of that was. But so, yeah, I mean, 
as part of your daily diet, you know, complex carbohydrates are going to be great to make up a majority of your daily diet because, you know, eventually, again, they're yeah, like you mentioned, like slow releasing, they, they don't raise your blood sugar as much, but you know, eventually you're gonna, your body's going to store those as glycogen. And so you want to eat, you know, breads and pastas and rice and things like that are great staples for an endurance athlete just to promote muscle glycogen um, and, you know, replenishing your carbohydrate stores. When it comes to during exercise, though, I think that's the main difference. And during exercise for endurance athletes, any athletes in general, you just want to be eating simple, simple carbohydrates. And that's because you don't simple. I said it again, then too simple sugars, but I guess simple carbohydrates would, would technically work as well. But, um, because you, when you're exercising, blood flow is diverted away from your intestines, away from your GI tract, away from your stomach. Digestion is not really occurring. You know, some does, but most of your blood flow is going to your skin to help you cool down. It's going to your working muscles. You know, blood flow needs to go to your working muscles so they can get the oxygen that they need to produce energy. So it's not going to your stomach. Digestion, you know, doesn't help or doesn't occur. So you want to take in simple sugars like from energy gels. Glucose and fructose make sucrose make up the most of these energy gels that you'll see marathoners and things like that taking in. And that's because they are easier to digest. Again, you know, you don't, you're not going to see me eating a loaf of uh, a whole grain bread, like during my marathon one, because it's hard to chew, but two, any, anything that you actually eat that requires a little bit more digestive processes to occur is going to be harder for your body to use. So you just want something that is quick energy that your body's going to, you know, it's going to directly go to your blood glucose and that your body's going to be able to use. So endurance athletes want to look for those simple sugars during exercise, you know, whether that comes from an energy gel or whether that comes from a banana or honey or maple syrup, you know, those can work as well. Um, those are all going to be great things during exercise. Now, obviously, outside of the context of exercise, I'm not really a fan of even endurance athletes using sports nutrition products. Again, unless you're like a Tour de France cyclist, I just think outside of exercise, I kind of try to limit my own sugar consumption. Sure, I eat fruit, I have dessert and things like that sometimes, but I'm not, uh, you know, eating dinner and like having a goo energy gel or something like that. I just think sports nutrition, pro nutrition products are built for a purpose and that is during exercise. Uh, but that, yeah, that's what endurance athletes and, and, you know, again, like we keep saying endurance athletes, but athletes who are looking to fuel during actual exercise, like you just want to look to simple sugars. That's why Gatorade and things like that are so popular among athletes. Moving on into the running side of things. To start off with protocols for people looking to improve their running, um, obviously you're coming at this from a, from a competitive, competitive runner's perspective. But uh, I think that's always a good place to look, even if you're a quote-unquote hobbyist runner, even if you're an amateur runner, you should look to what professionals are doing right because they're hopefully doing it right. Um, what does an average week of training look like for you, Brady, as somebody that, like you said, runs 5K, 10K, half marathon, marathon um, distances? What, what, what's the average week looking like in terms of volume and how that volume is split up? And, and are you abiding by that old school Norwegian 80-20 rule? Is, are 80% are of your miles done in that zone two range and then 20%? Um, really looking to push the limits in terms of VO2 max. Um, yeah, give us the ins and outs of it. My approach in the past few years has been a little non-traditional for a runner such as myself. Um, and that's just simply due to me struggling with uh, bone stress injuries, which I think were the result of maybe pushing the running frequency and the mileage um, up a little bit too much. So I tend to have a lower mileage approach compared to I would say most runners of my caliber but it's by no means a low running approach so I'll kind of talk about what I do and then I'll talk about maybe what most runners kind of like me would do they're going to be somewhat the same though so currently I, I run four days per week and I ride a bike the other three days per week I simply just have my bike inside on an indoor trainer I don't really do outside riding so it's essentially a bike um uh, my running, so I do four days per week. One of those runs is, I'm going to speak in miles here, but I can maybe translate that into time as well. So one of those runs typically is a 13 to 15 mile run. So that will take me an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes to complete. Um, one of those days per week, I'm doing high intensity or higher intensity intervals. 
that what that workout looks like just varies from week to week. So I won't really provide much about what I'm doing like that, but that will typically be an hour and a half to two hours total, not of all intervals. That's warm up, cool down, things like that. But that would be what you would consider kind of like my VO2 max workout, my threshold workout, lactate threshold training workout, something like that. Um, I'm getting my intervals in on that day. The total amount of time that I'm actually doing the intervals might be like 30 to 45 minutes where my heart rate is actually elevated pretty high. Um, another day is typically a recovery run. So it's going to be an hour, maybe to 80 minutes long. And then I have one long run per week where I'm running two to two and a half hours or more. So those are the four days that I'm running right now. If you took a typical runner, um, again, of my caliber or maybe, you know, any just runner who was running, say, six or seven days a week, they would probably just be adding maybe a couple other zone two runs per week of an hour or more. Um, so their training approach would look similar to mine. Essentially, I've replaced my zone two easy running days with indoor biking um, is kind of what I have done. That typically lands me right now. I'm training for a marathon. I'm running between 60 and 70 miles per week. So I'm running for about six to seven hours total per week. And I ride my bike for another six hours uh, about every week. So my total training time ends up being anywhere around like 15, you know, 12 to 15 hours, depending on the week, um, depending on how high the week is, if it's a higher or a lower week. So that's kind of what my approach looks like. For most runners, again, who are doing something similar to what I'm doing, they're going to probably run six days per week, maybe take one off day. Um, they're going to be running 60, 70, 80 miles per week, maybe even more, 90. That's typically the range of um, what competitive kind of amateur recreational runners like myself are doing. But of course, professional runners, they're even professional runners who run that amount of miles. They're, they're just uh, doing it faster. In my distribution, yeah, it actually does uh, end up falling into kind of that 80-20 distribution. If anything, it's even higher, maybe 85-15. So 85% lower intensity and 15% higher intensity stuff. Um, so I do do a lot of low intensity training despite um, you know doing one interval workout every week. I typically always uh, do an interval workout on the bike as well sometimes or something a little more high intensity. For um, an endurance runner, I suppose I'll um, I'll, I'll say marathon runner, so people kind of and to give you and people listening a uh, a barometer or a specific kind of man woman to measure it by. What are key metrics that a marathon runner should be looking to? Are there kind of objective standards in terms of a five k time? a 10k time a half marathon time that a marathon runner wants to be hitting and obviously you can speak about those in absolute terms or obviously relative to what their marathon or um goal marathon time is and, and are there does this extend to sprint time such as a, a 400 meter sprint a 100 meter sprint a 30 meter sprint are, are, are there objective standards they should look to be hitting I think for for the sprint times, uh, probably less relevant. I'm not sure how much that would, how much relevance that would have to your to your marathon time. So maybe not so much there. I think a good key metric that a lot of people, you know, can can I think use and and try to improve something simple is like their one mile time, um, their 1500 meter time. I guess if you're looking if you're thinking about it that way, there it's a similar distance. Um, I think that's a good thing to try to improve because if your mile time gets better, you know, it doesn't directly translate to running a better marathon, but you know, if I get myself from running a four minute and 50 seconds mile mile to a four minute and 30 second mile, I've become a better runner in some way. You know, I've probably become stronger and faster. So ultimately if you can run a faster mile, your marathon pace is going to feel a lot easier relatively for your body. So I think a lot of people, you know, in their marathon training or, you know, they could think about, oh, well, how fast can I run a mile? And maybe during your marathon training, actually doing a couple mile time trials to see kind of where you land. I, I think I have maybe more, um, I could put more kind of objective what your mile time could be versus these other times. I mean, it's just going to differ so much that I'd be hesitant to provide a recommendation of this should be your 5K, this should be your 10K. Maybe I'll talk about the half marathon a little bit in terms of what people might be able to look for um, to predict their marathon time or what they should sort of aim for. But a mile time, you know, I think 
six to eight between six minutes and eight minutes for pretty decent endurance runners um would be great no matter if you're you know if you're a, a male or a female i think six to eight minutes is is a great range you know males if you're faster getting closer towards that six minute range you know females down below that seven minute range those would be stellar times to aim for and you know that's going to put you in the top 0.5 percent of people if you can kind of get your mile time down there again you know i don't have any like direct numbers or references or ranges and, and if people do like a quick search they can probably search for standards but that's kind of again gonna be hard to provide recommendations there i think though for anybody who's like going to be training for a marathon or say something like that the rule of thumb kind of that i've heard and again this is going to apply to everyone because there are different types of of runners but if you know you take your half marathon time and you double it and then you add 10 minutes that might give you a rough estimation of what you could run for a marathon if your kind of pace will translate pretty well to the marathon and given you know you're sufficiently trained for the marathon so i think that every, anyone if you're training for a marathon you should run a half marathon in practice maybe a month six weeks out from your marathon just as a test and try to run that at a faster pace than your marathon um, to try to get an idea, you know, if you're trying to run a, let's just use three hours. It's a very fast time, but let's use three hours as, as that kind of standard. So if you're a man or a woman looking to run three hours for the marathon, then you want to look to be able to run your half marathon in um, 125, an hour and 25 minutes. So that's at a faster pace than your marathon is going to be, but um, you're going to be running slower for your marathon, but for longer. So if you double that, add 10 minutes, that puts you at three hours. So 125 or below probably puts you in the range of, okay, that's your within your kind of capability of running a marathon. If you can't break an hour and 30 in the half marathon, well, you're sure as hell not going to break your three hours in the marathon. So you don't just take your half marathon time and double it to predict what you can run for the marathon. You need to be able to run significantly faster you know if you look at these professional marathon runners the best guys right now you know they're going to be running 205 for a marathon or something like that all of those guys can run under 60 minutes under one hour for the half marathon so they're incredibly fast um so i think that's a good kind of metric to use the half marathon i don't have the same kind of grasp on what that means for like a 5k or a 10k or, or anything like that What's the best way to increase running volume? Is it better to keep the same amount of runs per week and increase the mileage of those runs? Or is it better to keep the mileage of your runs the same and then add extra sessions, whether that be on a, a day you're already not running or do double days so you run in the morning, then run in the evening? Yeah, I would say to do it in phases. And so... If you're newer to running or if you're just starting out a training phase, the best way to increase your volume is just going to be to keep your keep your run distance the same and add another day or another two days per week. So let's say you're running 30 minutes, three days per week. You want to add volume. Okay, run 30 minutes, four days per week, and then run 30 minutes for five days per week. After you've done that for... I don't know, maybe a month. So you've run, you run four days per week for a month. You run five days per week for a month. After you've done that, then I would say add volume to your existing days. So stay running five days per week, but on two of those days, for example, or maybe just one of those days, run for 45 minutes. So add 15 minutes to two of your runs and then add 15 minutes to three of your runs. So kind of follow a similar pattern until you're running five days per week of 45 minutes. Then do two 60 minute runs per week. So I would say frequency first, add days, but keep your run the same distance, and then add volume to your existing run. That's kind of what I would recommend there. Um, so add time or and or distance. You know, if you add time, you're gonna add distance, but add time to your then existing runs, kind of once you reach the number of days that you would like to run per week. Then I think the next step after that, kind of an additional, maybe advanced approach then to increasing your volume is to add a double before you start to really, really increase your endurance. So let's use an example. Say someone wants to run 
20, be, be able to run 20 miles in a day. So on Sunday, they work themselves up to running, um, say they're running 10 miles and then they run 15 miles. So maybe then rather than jump to 18 miles the next week, or maybe even instead of running 10 or set, instead of running 15 miles at once on your Sunday or any day, maybe you have the time to do it, run 10 miles in the morning in 15 or five, sorry, not 15, five in the evening. So that gives you 15 miles on the day, but you're not doing that all at once. What that's going to do is reduce your injury risk and allow you to accumulate that miles, but that mileage or kilometrage, I guess I have to kind of speak in both of these. I use miles. I'm sorry. I'm in the United States. So, um, accumulate that mileage without the added stress on your joints, um, without the, you know, added kind of fueling difficulties or hydration difficulties that might come with running 15 miles at once. So then have a double day every week where you run twice and you're getting up to say 12, 13, 14, 15 miles. And then after you've done double days for a little bit, kind of a similar strategy to what I proposed before, then, you know, do maybe 12 miles and three miles on that day. Then you can do 13 miles and two miles on your double day. And then you run 15 miles all at once. So you can work up to running 15 miles at once by doing 15 miles in one day, but you're breaking it up. Double days are just a way to kind of introduce your body to running higher mileage. I think all of those can be great approaches. I do that um, at least one day per week. I, I like to run, in addition to my long run, I like to do a 18 to 20 mile on, a, on the same day. But typically what that means is 15 miles in the morning and five miles in the afternoon rather than 20 miles all in the morning, in part just because I don't have in the morning, you know, I don't want to run for two and a half hours. So I run for, you know, a little less in the morning and then in the evening. So that could be a good approach as well. And I would really recommend that for people, especially, you know, ultra runners like you, Aaron, um, you know, doing a back-to-back -back long run on a weekend or on the weekend, you know, 20 miles in the morning and 10 in the afternoon instead of 30 all at once. It can make it easier mentally and physically, and it can be a good way to, to help increase your volume. I think something most runners, especially hobbyists, don't focus on enough is running form, running economy. I say this as somebody that, because I was by no means a runner growing up, never had any formal running coaching, my running economy is atrocious. Uh, it's kind of hard to talk about without demonstrating which you can't do uh, here and now over a podcast but do you have some kind of uh, descriptive cues um as to what constitutes good running form and tips for people on how they can improve their running form and running economy yeah the uh you know i'm not a, a biomechanist or a, a physical therapist or anything like that and so i think when it comes to form i think there is kind of a general consensus that you don't want to change too much. You know, if you, unless you have really bad running form and you're constantly getting injured because of it, most people are going to have their own little biomechanical quirks that are just, it is what it is. That's how your body learned to run. And you should probably stay running like that. But I think some of the best cues that all runners could focus on one, when you're running, you want to, you know, kind of keep your shoulders back and keep your head up looking kind of straight. You don't want to slouch over or bend over it's going to put strain on your neck. It's just going to be uncomfortable. So, you know, focus on kind of look at the horizon is a cue that I've typically gotten uh, from, you know, that people have told me to do and kind of try to keep your shoulders back instead of slump forward. Um, slight tilt in your pelvis. So you kind of want to almost, this is, has been one of the biggest changes I've actually made to my running form when I started working with um, some people in the last few years, but you kind of just want to, Make it feel like you're sticking your ass out, honestly, when you're running. It, it will feel like you are, but you're really not if you looked at yourself in a mirror. But kind of like you're just uh, tilting your pelvis again and like almost feel like you're kind of sticking your butt out. That's going to help. And I kind of hate this word, but, you know, engage your glutes. Your glutes are always like engaged, but it does help get a little bit more power kind of from your glutes when you're running. Um, that's definitely a cue that I focus on. You almost want to kind of just uh, feel like you're like sucking in while you're running, sucking in on like your belly button area. I think that's a good cue. Um, arms, big one, obviously, for most people. Avoid crossing them over your body. You just want to come kind of like uh, from your hip up to your shoulder. Um, you want to swing them like that. So almost like you're sprinting, but obviously in like slow motion kind of. Um, and then regarding like legs, I think, 
the best thing is to focus on knee drive. So pick up your feet. Don't drag your feet. You And this is a good cue. You can, if you're running and you are hearing your shoes kind of like scrape on the ground, I'm guilty of this. Uh, so I need to, something I need to work on. But if your shoes are scraping on the ground, focus on picking up your legs. So really focus on like knee drive and kind of picking up your legs, driving them forward. That can be a good cue as well. I think those are kind of the simplest and the best ones. Again, you know, the a, a discussion on running form could take, you know, five hours. And, you know, if you talk to, talk to somebody about it, they could give you very, very good uh, things to work on. But that's going to be highly individual, again, of what people should work on. But those cues in general, I think, are what kind of constitute a quote unquote good running form and can kind of help everyone with their running economy, I would say. A question's finished that is um, completely of my own self-interest. As I mentioned, I've taken on in the past uh, few years, for better or worse, a tendency um, for just pushing myself through these these ultra uh, marathon challenges that really I have no business doing. But um, a bit of a spoiler alert for anybody listening to this that is at all interested in my um, athletic endeavours and craziness. Next year, uh, at the end of March, I'm planning on running 100 miles in 24 hours, uh, which will by far and away be the um, longest ultramarathon that I have ever done. What tips do you have for me, Brady, um, for my training over the next five months, if I'm going to make this happen? <laughs> yeah, well, first of all, good luck. And I think uh, I'll have to follow along with that. that. That sounds exciting. Not good luck in the, that you can't do it. I'm sure that you can, but um, that's an exciting endeavor. So, you know, I think I, not, not being an ultra marathon runner myself i think some of the best things that you are going to want to focus on you know going back to the beginning of our conversation practicing fueling during those long training runs that you have and figuring out what foods you can kind of eat during your run because you know it is a 24 hour race you are running 100 miles and so sure you could subsist on energy gels and gatorade but you might not want to do that you might want to eat some real food so experiment with things that are going to work. Maybe that's candy bars. Maybe it's pretzels. Maybe it's peanut butter sandwiches. I don't know. You know, everybody likes something different. Some ultra runners eat pizza during their uh, their race. Probably not what I would recommend. But you find something that works in training and, and kind of work with that and, and have a strategy, obviously, going into the race. I probably don't need to, to tell you that. But a strategy of what you're going to eat, when you're going to eat it, how much you're going to eat. So, you know, I'm sure you're a pretty analytical guy and you'll probably plan all that stuff out beforehand. But I think that would be um, a good strategy. Uh, one, I think final thing, you know, I don't have, again, too many recommendations, not being super familiar with like the, the ultra running world, but I think one thing that you might want to practice is at least a couple of times during your training cycle, running without sleep or running on little sleep, because you are going to be doing that uh, during the 24 hour race. You're not I mean, you might sleep, but if you're going to try to complete 100 miles in 24 hours, maybe you'll just run and do, you know, go the whole time and you're not going to be able to sleep. So I would at least two to three times. And it, it was funny, there was actually like a training, the study on this, like a case study that I wrote about a few years ago. I'll have to send you this. I think I wrote about it at least, but it was like basically sleep deprivation training. So this guy was training to run like an ultra marathon and they did sleep deprivation training. So he would do a training run, you know, uh, in the morning and then not sleep at night. And then the next morning he would go on another run. So for you, I think if that is your plan, and you don't plan to sleep. I would practice not sleeping once or twice just to know how it feels, just to know that you could do it. Practice what your caffeine strategy is going to be. Um, I think that could be super helpful for you if you're trying to execute that goal. Thank you. That's really helpful. I thought about the fueling aspect, but I had not, um, th the plan in my head was, oh yeah, I'm uh, the plan is not to sleep, it's to just run for 24 mm -hmm. hours. Um, but yeah, I, I hadn't considered the fact that it's, it's actually prudent to test out that uh, theory a couple of times before to see how I run whilst incredibly sleep deprived. So I'll, uh, I've taken note of that. Yeah, that's something I'll definitely try out beforehand. And maybe not, you know, I don't think you need to do it two or three times, at least once though, maybe twice, wouldn't hurt. But just to see, I think you need to know like, what it feels like. And often, you know, 24 hours, it would be different if it was, you know, five days or a week, 24 hours sometimes isn't enough. You're going to be running on so much adrenaline that it might not even matter. You might not get tired. I mean, I've pulled plenty of all-nighters before, you know, and 
I was younger and like ran a race after not running after prom. And so like, you can do it, but I think it would just be, you know, it would be interesting for you just to know how your body's going to respond to say, maybe do it on a weekend. So on a Saturday you go out and you run 20, 25 miles, you stay up all Saturday, don't go to bed Saturday night. And then Sunday morning, go out and do another one. So do back-to-back long runs with sleep deprivation just to know like, okay, when this comes during my race, I know I can handle it. Um, it's no big deal. And I've at least experienced like what it's like to, to run on no sleep and maybe even during the night, like go out and run a little bit instead of sleep, just go, uh, run for a couple hours, <laughs> get some friends to do it with you too. Make it less boring. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to struggle let's get some friends to, yeah you might (laughs) you might have to pay them or uh incentivize them somehow (laughs) but yeah yeah, that's that's a very smart idea in in my mind i was just thinking all david goggins oh yeah i'll be able to run through the night 24 hours easy but um yeah it's definitely the the devil you know is always better than the devil you don't so at least if you've experienced it once i think that's a a smart thing to do um brady this was a great conversation. I think we'll, if you're up for it, we'll have to do another one at some point because I had some questions noted down on the longevity side of things, which I know you're very interested in uh, that we didn't get around to today. But um, yeah, I really appreciate everything you've shared. I've taken note of a lot of it and I think it will help a lot of people listening. Before we go, where can people go if they want to read your work, if they want to get more tips from you? Yeah, where can they go for all that? My Substack will be probably the one of the best ways, um, if they go to physiologically speaking.com, um, that's where I write. That's kind of like my blog, my newsletter. They can sign up for that there. Um, and then on X, you could follow me at B underscore Homer. I'm very active on there as well. So those are the two primary places, uh, people can find me if they want. And there you'll be able to find like anything I post about like a book or whatever I'm doing. So yeah, those two places. And, um, Aaron, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. I'd love to do a round two. I think it would be fun to get to some of the topics on just like longevity and health span rather than maybe some like biohacking stuff versus like endurance training. But uh, thanks for inviting me on. This was a, this was a really great chat. My pleasure, Brady. Thank you.